Welcome to Epics of Life. My name is Adam Hanlon, and I'm joined by our expert in all things underwater photography, Alexeyevich Mustadovich. There we are. It's even Hi, better that time, wasn't it? Are you impressed? Yes, my, my correct name, I think, is down there. <laughs> um, so, one of the things, obviously, that's happened to us all in these strange times that we live in um, is that travel's been significantly restricted. Um, and whilst, of course, that's affected us all as underwater photographers because we're used to travelling pretty widely, um, one of the other one of the, one of its effects is it has possibly um, meant that we spent more time shooting subjects at home. And um, from that, obviously, always to extract a positive, we can learn lots of things about um, improving our technique when we're shooting in conditions that are less ideal than possibly we're not we're normally used to. Um, so Alex and I thought we'd devote an episode today to about some some techniques um, for shooting in limited visibility, um, obviously um, opposite to the time. Um, and as usual, I'm going to throw Alex a, a difficult question or a curves question to start off with and ask him um, what's his favourite, what's his most important technique for shooting in limited visibility. Thanks, Adam. Um, <laughs> as, um, I think what, what I would say to begin with is first of all, if you are finding yourself you know, diving in, low, in, in local conditions and you've got some flexibility over your schedule, do your research and try and find the best visibility available. Yeah. Be aware of the effect, for example, in, in the sea of tides yep. and how incoming and high tides often have clearer water than outgoing and low tides. Yep. Be, and, and time your dive trips to coincide with that. Get online and do some research about visibility. Here in the UK, there's a, a you know, there's a group on Facebook called UK Visibility Reports. And, you know, if you know the local places you can di you dive and you keep an eye on things like that, you can get pretty good up-to-date information. Oh, the visibility is getting better. Oh, there was some rain. Oh, there's some windy weather. The visibility is getting worse again. Yep. And just keep an eye on things. And then finally, you can do a lot by, if you're planning to dive in the next coming days, also keep an eye on the weather forecast. Rain, to some degree, particularly if there's rivers near the dive site, but particularly the wind as well, if you're getting stormy winds coming in in the direction of, of the place you're planning to dive, that can also mess up your visibility. So anything that anything that moves the water around, so that could be yeah. tides, a very strong tide, so it's obviously if you've got a great deal well, of tidal action. We just have huge, big September big, springs. Big so, spring yeah. tides, yeah, so they obviously affect it, and particularly those in conjunction with wind, which you know, obviously locally affects the, bo the bottom, comp stirs the bottom composition up, will affect the visibility adversely, yeah, sure. Or, or positively, yeah, and, depending on what's happening, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's really worth getting, you know, getting to know the good wind predicting um, apps um, or, or websites and things. Yeah. I know one that a lot of people here in the UK use is called XC Weather. It's yeah. got really good wind forecasts for different locations around the coast, and it's really good for judging wind direction. Obviously, if you have a an eastward, we have predominantly prevailing westerly winds here. Yeah. A lot of the popular shore diving sites are eastward facing, yeah. and it can be very protected from prevailing westerly winds. Yeah. But if you get easterly winds like we had last weekend, that can make a really big mess of a lot of, of the popular shore diving sites. Yep. But actually, some of the less popular sites can really come on strong then. So having that bit of new research is really valuable. Um, the, the best thing to do that is to chat to local divers. I mean, that, I think that's yeah. probably, you know, the, the, the locals will know what's going on in their patch. So, so it's a really good opportunity to cultivate contacts. Sorry, carry on, Alex. Yes. Yeah. Although if they start going, oh, no, it's really bad, it's really bad, <laughs> maybe they found some cool subjects down there. Yeah, anyway, possibly. I'm only joking. Yeah. Um, the other thing that is really, um, really um, important is also to look after the vis in low visibility diving. Yeah. A lot of low visibility diving, because there's lots of bits in the water, there's lots of bits on the seabed. You know, the, the sediment that's in the water also settles on the seabed. And the thing that's going to ruin your pictures more than anything is you stirring that up because... Yeah you're then creating a very, very sediment-rich water to shoot through if yeah. you're searching it up. And I know no one goes in the water to do it, but being aware of what's going on behind your back is, is really important. Um, you know, again, just here in the UK, I know lots of photographers who won't dive with other photographers because they always kill the viz. So okay, they force fins. Other fins are able to destroy the viz, but none better than force fins, it seems. Yes. Um, I'm only, only, only joking about that. Um, not really. Um, and, <laughs> um, so, but I think those things are really important and getting good buoyancy. I think one of the things I really love about diving in a dry suit is is that whole body length buoyancy. That and it gives trim. You. 
Yeah. yeah, and and I really and I find it particularly easy in that. But if you're relatively, say, new to diving in in the in in your home conditions, or you haven't done it for a while, um, it's worth making sure you're on top of those things before you start trying to take too many photos. You know, and it's actually where some of the the, the freshwater locations are really good for working through those skills. Um, just just a day or two of diving can really turn you Make from a big being difference. someone who's going to kick yeah. it all up to someone who's really yeah. on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. a good yeah. diver already it will come back pretty quickly. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I, I know people didn't want to tune in for me talking about diving skills and, and weather forecasts. Um, so photographically, the golden rule in low visibility diving is to get close to your subject. Um, backscatter and particles in the water are a three-dimensional problem. You get backscatter from the amount of water that the lens is looking through that the flash guns are also firing through. Yeah, traveling through. And if you imagine that the lens is seeing out as a cone, and each of the flash guns is firing out as a cone of light, um, those cones, it's the volume of water in, enclosed in those cones that creates backscatter. Yep. And the easiest way to reduce the volume that both the camera is looking through and the lights are shining to is to get the camera closer to the subject. Yep. So, you know, the absolute golden rule, you know, for low visibility shooting is to get close and get closer still. Yep. And there's a number of things you can do to do to, 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 to achieve that. It's first of all, you know, put on lenses that allow you to focus super close. Yep. Maybe go a little bit wider than you normally would if you were, say, a full frame SLR shooter like me, and you normally shoot 105 mil for a lot of your macro. Think about going to a 60 mil. Yep. If you're, you know, you, you know, if, again with a wide angle lens, maybe put a smaller dome port on your fisheye so it for, allows you to get even closer to your subjects and and go for close focus wide angle. So I think the crucial crucial thing here we're saying is that choose your equipment to suit the conditions. So you know, mm. if you're anticipating shooting in lower visibility, try and think about the equipment that you might normally use in blue water with, with and, and try and anticipate the fact that you're gonna to need to get that, that equipment closer than you're used to. Um, and that's that's something we can do, you know, that's a decision we take on land before we get anywhere near the water. And that's that's a really mm -hmm. important one. Um, yeah. 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 And, and, and I think I was wanting to finish with this, but I think it's such an important point I'm bringing it up now. And that is, it's. People often say, oh, well, if you can take pictures in low visibility, you can take pictures anywhere. Mm. But what's important is that you learn to shoot to the conditions. So if you go out and the visibility is good, then you're much freer to, to shoot a wider range of shots. Yep. If you go out and the visibility is poor, yes, you're limited to close focus macro and close focus wide angle. Yep. And there's certainly no limitation on shooting wide angle, really, for me in low visibility. You can take great wide angle in low visibility. Um, you can take great macro in low visibility, yep. but you can't shoot the big scene shots and you can't shoot long distance macro yep. in those conditions. Cool. And so it's about shooting these conditions. So the main limitation is wide angle becomes very much close focus wide angle. Yeah, so obviously um, when we talk about macro, um, one of the important things about macro, obviously super macro is, is by definition, we're getting even closer to the subject. So there's really no limits on what we can achieve in macro and limited visibility. Um, sea conditions and, and everything else notwithstanding, I, there's no reason why we can't shoot macro images in a very similar way to how we shoot them in, in, in more exotic and, and, and better visibility areas of the world. Um, and, and so in fact, many times the, the creatures in, in, in temperate waters are even more fascinating than those in, uh, in, in tropical waters. So anyway, that's subjective probably. Well, maybe less shot, definitely. So, so yeah. uh, more unique, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, then on to strobes, I think there's a lot we can do with our strobes to really help things, and that's kind of the, the main meat of this. Yeah. So the first thing is, is think about your strobe powers. One technique that lots of people use in, in low visibility diving is to shoot much more predominantly with available light in terms of their wide angle shots, and then just put a tickle of flash in. That way you're, you, you know, you're putting less of the stuff that's gonna create the backscatter into the picture. Yeah. You may be slightly under lighting your subjects, but as a result, I think you you end up with much less backscatter. Yeah, uh, and control. It's all about control. Um, you know, whereas in, in in clear blue water with not much more stuff in it, you can get away with cranking the strobe powers up. But the moment you do that in in, in limited visibility, you, it's going to end up looking like a snowstorm. So so mm -hmm. when people say they've got a backscatter problem, they haven't got a backscatter problem. They've actually typically got a lighting problem. Um, and, and the crucial thing here is thinking always think control, 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 control. And anything you can do to reduce the size of the cone that Alex spoke about earlier, um, and obviously power is one way of reducing that cone. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. you've got less power, it reaches less far. So so um, yeah. And something that a lot of us do in those conditions is is to knock the ISO up. So again, you're just 
making it easier to work with that available light without that available light blurring too much. Yeah. Um, I think those things can, can work well. Um, so other things that can reduce the size of, of those cones of light coming out of the, the flash guns is first of all, turning one of them off. You halve your problem in one go. Yeah. And there's a lot, a lot of underwater photography that can be done really well with single flash. Yep. And think particularly for macro shooting, for fish portraits, that sort of thing. Think, do I need two flash guns? I may have bought two flash guns, but this might be the time that turning one off can really help. I think this is a really good point that, that I'll normally go in the water with two flash guns, but that doesn't mean that both flash guns are actually switched on. So, so um, you know, two gives you options that you don't have with only having one, but equally, um, you know, frequently I'll turn one off and just shoot with one. Yeah, a really, really, really useful tip. Um, then the other thing that I use a lot in temperate water is if I'm going to do really close focus wide angle, I'll typically always keep my diffusers on. But if I want to shoot slightly bigger scenes or I'm shooting macro, I'll then get rid of my diffusers and start using beam restrictors. And what these do is you just, you know, they, they can be homemade or in this case, these are commercially made ones with the strobe. They clip onto the strobe and what they do is they, they still give the strobe a nice wide beam, but they then give a hard edge to that beam. Yeah. And that hard edge of the beam makes the, the light more controllable. You're not spraying light everywhere. It's keeping that cone tighter. And actually, Retro have a, a whole series of stackable ones that you can just push on the next one in the chain and have an even smaller output yeah, or nice. even a, a smaller one again. And they just push on through. And I tend to keep these on my, my carry handle lanyard yep. if I'm going to do a lot of that. And it just gives you a, a tighter and tighter beam of light. So you only need to light what you want and you're not lighting up loads of water. And I find these really nice system. Yeah. You can do exactly the same with that, you know, a, a plant pot, a, you know, old plastic bottle. Plumbing fittings. Like, yeah. <laughs> all those things will do that job for you really nice. Old, old wetsuit sleeve as well work, works really, really well. Yeah, yeah. And by the same definition, snoop photography also really well suited to low visibility shooting. Yeah. So if, you, if you're expecting low visibility, you want good, clean black backgrounds and really nicely sharp pictures. Snoop's are a really good technique. You're obviously not going to have a, a dive guide there to aim it for you typically when you're diving at home. But um, if you can learn to shoot a snoop by yourself, I think it gives you a really powerful technique in yeah. those conditions. Oh. Uh, um, sorry, Adam. I, I, one thing I was going to say, which is a little bit slightly at odds what we talked about as well, and obviously Alex and I are shooting in the UK where the water conditions are often quite cold. Um, and, and this is actually ironically one of the few places where I will occasionally revert back to TTL. Um, in terms of managing my strobes. And it's purely that sometimes my fingers just get too cold to adjust my strobes. At that point, I revert to CTL. Now, at that point, actually controlling the output of the strobe becomes very, very difficult. Um, and if you are a TTL shooter, bear in mind that you do still have some level of adjustment of the TTL. So if you are a TTL strobe shooter, turn that TTL down, whether you do that in the camera or you do that, and do it before your fingers get too cold to, to actually deal with it. Sorry, I digress. Yeah. yeah no the final things I wanted to mention are kind of more compositional um, mm. in terms of solving backscatter. Backscatter, little white specks, are going to show up most clearly against a clean black background. Yep. So if you are in very dirty water, look for compositions maybe where your, sub, your, your scene completely fills the frame. Yep. Then you won't see the backscatter because it's not against the open dark water. Yep. If you're shooting macro or wide angle, you know, expose to get, you know, slow your shutter speed down and get a nice bright green, blue background coming through again white specks aren't going to show up that much against a nice bright green background. Yep. You know, so things like this, they, they are changing the look of the picture that you maybe were trying to get, but they will do a really good job of hiding the backscatter. So shooting into the reef so subject matter fills the whole frame, or using longer exposures so the brightness of the background hides the backscatter, or play around with techniques like panning and things, because again, the backscatter doesn't look quite so bad when everything's being, when it's stretched into streaks and things like that. Um, and that, that can help hide things as well. But all those are obviously changing the type of picture you're taking to hide backscatter. Or, you may I mean, like change, you may not like that change. The, the other compositional technique is to use the backscatter. I mean, there's, some, there's been some very effective images where people have, have created starry night like images um, mm -hmm. where they've used black background, they've, they've allowed the backscatter to be there um, mm -hmm. and surrounded it with a nice subject. And so, you know, I think, 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 laterally, think, well, think compositionally creatively to, to if you can't beat it figure out how you're going to use it so yeah yeah, yeah no that's, that's a very good point Adam. Yeah. I think the, the fun thing I wanted to, to, to finish on is just to re-stress the fact 
that first of all, don't get too het up about backscatter. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, the sea has particles in it. And as long as they're not such a distraction that you can't enjoy the picture, then don't worry about them. Yeah. They can also be dealt with in post-processing. And I'm sure Go Ask Gary has got some really good tutorials about dealing with backscatter. Yeah. So again, if you've got an amazing shot that's just got a little bit too much backscatter for your taste, there's plenty you can do in post to, to, to deal with it should you need to. Yeah. And then finally, shoot to the conditions. Yeah. Don't just get so entrenched in techniques that eliminate backscatter that all your photography ends up being about not eliminating back, back, eliminating backscatter. Yeah. Ultimately, you want to shoot to the conditions. If you get good visibility, start trying to take those bigger scene shots. Yeah. Because actually, those shots are often much less shot than close focus wide angle. Certainly here in the UK, everyone goes down when they've got a wide angle lens on and does their close focus wide angle. And actually, you see very few more expansive wide angle shots. So it's something I always challenge myself to, is to try and shoot the biggest scenes I can in the conditions, not just stick with the safe techniques. Yep. Yep. Um, but ultimately, yeah, getting close, controlling those cones of light by beam restrictors, by getting close, those are the big things that are really gonna make a difference. And I think, and then I think it's, it's, I think it's Martin Edge. He was always just say F8 and be there. Was that? I don't know if I'm, I'm wrongly attributing the quote, but I think the other thing is to encourage people to go out. You know, okay, we may not be able to travel. Go out, get your camera gear out, go out and dive locally, go and see what you can get. You know, and experiment with these techniques. Um, you know, there's plenty of wonderful photographic subjects in, that are, that occur in less than ideal conditions. So, um, you know, it's a shame not to not to go out and and and, and still be shooting. Um, even though maybe we, we're not able to shoot in our in our, our first choice of destination sometimes. Anyway, um, thank you, Alex. Lots lots of great info there. Um, Alex is shooting locally at the moment, so um, if you watch his Instagram feed at um, Alex Mustard One. Alex Mustard One. And if you actually look carefully at the photos on there, you'll see that you know most of my pictures have got backscatter. Yeah, every picture of Alex, I say, I always think, look at that backscatter. It's terrible. <laughs> no, I'm not so, I don't like the sort of antiseptically clean shots. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I will delete backscatter from my pictures that I feel is a distraction, yeah. but I never like to take it all out, just enough so that the viewer can enjoy the subject. The, the sea's got particles in it. Yeah, yeah, we shoot through stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Inon. Um, and um, I'd like to thank you all for watching as always um, please feel free to to give us a like if you enjoyed it um, and also of course to add your favorite tips or suggestions or also any topics that you want us to cover in future episodes in the comment section thank you very much I look forward to you soon.